cleanse my guilt and pride. Blood of Christ the Unleavened Bread Ministries presents from your hands your feet Unleavened your Bread Bible Studies with Jesus David Eels. What can quench my thirsting soul? Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. Greetings, saints. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We've been having a good time studying the Word. And um, recently we've been talking about not one of them perished. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for being our God, our Savior, our provider in all things. Lord, we know it's... Uh, it's your plan to teach us, to guide us, to grow us up quickly. Uh, obviously, Lord, as long as we abide in you and, and are teachable, um, you'll continue to guide us and give us your wisdom and guide us through these days ahead that we call the tribulation. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for raising up wise teachers, raising up anointed leaders, raising up your latter rain. And thank you most of all, Lord, for coming yourself to be our guide. Uh, Lord, um, it sounds very much from Ezekiel 34 like you're coming to shepherd your own sheep. It must mean that we're going to be closer to you than we've ever been in our spiritual life. In fact, maybe since the time of your first coming. Lord, that sounds exciting. Sounds exciting. Thank you so much, Lord. We're looking forward to it. Amen. Well, I'm going to read this verse to you. John 17 and verse 12. It's the verse we used for the title of this series. While I was with them... I kept them in thy name, which thou hast given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Well, what time was it here? It was obviously the, the end of Jesus' ministry, his three-and-a-half-year ministry. It was the time when, of course, the son of perdition was revealed by the falling away, as Second Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks about. Um, it would have been in the middle of our trib, and uh, it's a symbol of that, the time between the Gospels and, um, and uh, the book of Acts is uh, mid-trib, and... Um, at this time, Jesus had been betrayed by the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot. It was the end of the three and a half years, and he had kept them, and not one of them perished at that time. That doesn't mean that they all stayed that way, but at that time, not one of them perished. You know, some people say, some people believe, for instance, that the tribulation is only going to be three and a half years. And um, that would be a mistake. It would really ruin your revelation of the end times. In fact, if you go to Revelation 12, I'll point out to you one reason why that, that can't be true. And it also helps us to understand the, the scenario of the end time. Uh, revelation 12 Verse 5 says, And she was delivered of a son, a man-child, who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. And her son was caught up unto God and unto his throne. And this, of course, is the church who has brought forth the son of David for the end times. We, we read about it in Ezekiel 34. We'll go back over there again and just for a moment brush up, but... We notice there that the Lord was fed up with the false leadership of his people and he complained 
about their treatment of his people, and he said that he himself would come to shepherd his sheep. And then he said that he would raise up David to shepherd his sheep, obviously meaning that the Lord is coming like he came the first time in the son of David to shepherd his sheep. Now we see this man-child here is that son of David, okay, in whom lives the Lord, because the Lord said that he would come unto us on the morning of the third day, which is where we are now, uh, as the rain, as the latter rain that watereth the earth. Hosea 6, 1, 2, and 3 tells us that. So, so I'm going to read on here. Just In verse 6 it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, which we now see is the tribulation, where she hath been a place prepared of God that there they may nourish her, they, meaning the man-child, may nourish her a thousand two hundred and threescore days. So a thousand two hundred and sixty days, which is three and a half times a uh, three hundred and sixty day a year. So we're talking about three and a half years here that the woman flees into the wilderness and has a place prepared by God for her. Why? So that God can train her and give revelation to her and keep her and so on and so forth. And this provision also is spoken about down in um, verse 14. It says, And there was given unto the woman the two wings of the great eagle, meaning, of course, overcoming the world, right? God's gift to the people that follow the man-child, uh, that she might fly into the wilderness. The wilderness is how long? Well, in the, at least here we see that it's three and a half years. But in Revelation 17, we see it's three and a half more years um, during the time of the beast, not the time of the dragon. This is during the time of the dragon, okay? And... Um, Nourished for a time and times and a half a time. That's three and a half years. From the face of the serpent, which is who? The, the, and the great dragon was cast down, the old serpent, the great dragon. And what is it about the dragon? Well, the dragon in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3, it says, And there was seen another sign in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads seven diadems. So here you have the time of the dragon, which is the first three and a half years, the time of the woman, the first three and a half years, and the time of the man-child's ministry, the same as Jesus' ministry, three and a half years. Some people say they look at the feasts mentioned in the Gospels, and they say, well, it's only a little over a year. No, the feasts that they were talking about weren't in the same year. Uh, you know, why do we know that Jesus is following this type here? Is because the Bible says the things that have been are the things that shall be. The things that have been done are the things that shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. So we know that God is always repeating history. The reason the man-child here to so many religious people represents is Jesus is because they don't understand that history repeats. And Jesus himself said that he was coming again as a man-child born to a woman in John 16. So we see here this is this revelation that's being manifested right here. He is coming in by the latter rain in his first fruits, sons of David again. Okay. So, but the dragon in this case, had uh, seven heads and ten horns, and the, um, the crowns in Revelation 12 here were upon the heads, the seven crowns, seven diadems, or seven crowns were upon the heads. Yet, when we leave there and we go to chapter 13, we see another beast that has... Um, Verse 1, seven heads and horns, and on his horns ten diadems, and upon his heads names of blasphemy. So now you're talking about a whole different change of government here. Some people think these are the same, Revelation 12, Revelation 13. They're not, obviously. You see the crowns on the horns here and on the heads over here. It's a different 
difference in the government. And obviously, chapter 13 is also, it says, for, what, 42 months in verse 5. And it was given unto him authority to continue this beast 40 and 2 months, which is also, you know, 30 times 42 is 1260. Once again, you got another three and a half years here. So uh, we see that there's two three and a half year periods, right? And after six years, they always added another 30 days. So that's how you end up with the 1260 and the 1290. Because that's what the tribulation is made up of, 1260 and 1290. Um, that is, of course, to, to make a solar correction. And, and we know here that the saints were protected in this first three and a half years, as we can see. They were protected. And even the dragon tried to make war with them, but, but went away to make war with the rest of her seed. He was not able to destroy them. Okay. But, you know, between these two chapters is when the mark of the beast comes. It's going to come because the people of the world are tribulating and persecuting, not necessarily killing yet, but persecuting God's people. And um, it's going to come because the world itself wants a separation from them. And this, of course, identifies, this mark of the beast will identify those who are truly members of the body of the beast, even if they walk in the midst of the body of Christ and claim to be Christian. Because there's going to be a great falling away, the Bible says, and this great falling away is going to identify the sons of perdition who walk in the midst of the body. Remember, Jesus said that not one of them perished except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. At the end of Jesus' ministry, what happened was the son of perdition was used to crucify the body of Christ at the end of three and a half years. Notice that. To crucify the body of Christ, the body of the son of perdition, because that's who it is in our day, uh, was used to crucify the body of Christ. And then what happened? The son of perdition was hung on a tree also. Remember? So basically, this is the time, the end of chapter 12 represents the time when things turn around, the persecution becomes more, and the war is made upon the saints. And that's down in chapter 13 and verse, uh, let me read that to you. Verse 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, meaning, of course, their flesh, right? And there was given unto him, that's what the beast is being raised up for, folks, to crucify the flesh. You know, every type and shadow we see in the Bible, first the natural, then the spiritual, right? For instance, the, the man-child. Jesus, his flesh was put to death, wasn't it? Well, what does that symbolize in our covenant? I mean, that's what we're here for, is to have the flesh put to death, isn't it? It doesn't necessarily mean physical. First the natural and then the spiritual. You know, every other type of the man-child, like Joseph, went through the full seven years, did he not? And Jesus, too, he said to his disciples when he left in Matthew 28 and 20 that he would be with them unto the end of the age. And in Acts 16, we see the spirit of Jesus um, speaking to the disciples to give them direction. So we know that he was still with them, but he was with them more in spirit than flesh, right? And Moses went halfway through the wilderness. We found out the wilderness is three and a half years, Revelation 12, but it's also three and a half years in Revelation 13. And so we see that Moses went halfway through the wilderness, went up on the mountain of God, and his face was transformed, meaning he was became spiritual. He was uh, crucified. The spiritual man was manifested in him. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, his, this glory shone out of his face, right? So we have other types of the man-child that show us this, and even Jesus shows us this. So we have to translate what we see from the letter to the Spirit. First, the parable is fulfilled naturally and then spiritually. So I know that I've taught this in more in depth in the past, so I'm not trying to go into it in depth right here. I just want to point out that there's two three-and-a-half-year periods, 
And the timing of the son of perdition is that it, it, his manifestation as the son of perdition, his revelation as the son of perdition, comes at the end of the first three and a half years. And also the, um, the first stage of crucifixion comes at the end of the first three and a half years. So if we go from here back to where we were teaching in Ezekiel 34, I'll just remind you a little bit of what we saw here in Ezekiel 34. Uh, once again, uh, the Lord said he was going to come to shepherd his sheep. He said he was going to come, Hosea 6, 2 and 3, on the morning of the third day which is where we are now, the first, the third thousand year day right now. And he was going to come as the latter rain. So with that anointing. And we saw that he came in a body of the son of David, verse 23. And when he came in David is the same as Jesus coming in the son of David at the beginning of his ministry. And what did he do? He led the disciples into the wilderness. He taught them. He fed them. He took care of them and didn't lose them. Right? They didn't perish, right? Okay? So, and we see that, that not perishing in the end of chapter 34. Matter of fact, it says they dwelt securely in the wilderness. Uh, verse um, 25, they dwelt securely in the wilderness. And uh, it says they were secure in their land. Verse 27, uh, he, he broke the bars of their yoke. He uh, delivered them out of the hand of those that made bondmen of them. Verse 27, um, they shall no more be a prey to the nations, neither shall the beasts of the earth devour them, for they shall dwell securely. So this is a time that we're talking about here at the first three and a half years of Jesus' ministry where they were preserved and taught and yet hated by the beast, right? So... And in verse 35, we actually read in our last meeting, uh, verse 35, somewhat, and it spoke of Edom. Edom being the, uh, the seed of Esau. And Esau, of course, we understood, uh, represented the father of those who sold their birthright because they were sons of Abraham, but they sold their birthright. Was there one among Jesus' disciples that did that? Yes, it was Judas, right? Judas Iscariot sold his birthright. Uh, he had been chosen of the Lord, but yet he Satan entered into him, and he was called the son of perdition, and he was used to crucify the body of Christ. And, of course, we know a body of people that's hidden in the midst of the body today is going to do the exact same thing. And we saw uh, in chapter 35, I believe, that ministry of the son of perdition against their brethren. You know, hidden in the midst of the body of Christ today, just as Jesus was hidden in the midst of the body back then, is this son of perdition. And their ministry, of course, is to bring the body of Christ to crucifixion. They are enemies, but they are hidden in the midst. And it, just to point out a couple of things to you, I would say maybe verse 4, it says, I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, because thou hast had a perpetual enmity, and hast given over the children of Israel to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of the iniquity of the end. Well, that's a type and a shadow of what's coming for the people of God at the beginning of the second three and a half years and at the end of the first three and a half years, right there where Judas uh, was used to crucify Jesus. Um, perpetual enmity. We've seen this, obviously, in the letter between the people of God and the Edomites in our day. They've been constantly making war against Israel, and um, no peace, uh, cannot make peace, with them, and um, and obviously that's the same is true in the body of Christ today, because everything that happens naturally to the Jews happens spiritually to the church. In the body of Christ today, there are people that are just ornery all the time. They're they're uh, sons of perdition. They're critical. They're angry. They're always making war against their brothers. 
that you can find no peace with them. They have no love. They have sold their birthright, like Esau, who through a root of bitterness, Hebrews says, sold his birthright and um, lost his position in, in the kingdom of God. Well, notice it says here, um, I'm going to jump on down and read something. Verse 14, it says, Thus saith the Lord, When the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. As thou didst rejoice over the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Sir. That was the like the kingdom of Edom or Esau, right? And all Edom, even all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. How can God reject a whole people? Because they represented the same thing that Judas represented. Um, one of the brethren who went astray, sold their birthright, right? And now I want to back up to where we were in verse 5 and where it speaks about the iniquity of the end. Notice, there is a crucifixion of God's people here and then a destruction of the son of perdition or the Edomites that always joined with God's enemies. Literally speaking, when beast kingdoms came in to invade Israel and to conquer Israel for their rebellion, the Edomites always joined with the beast. Obviously, Judas was joined with the beast, wasn't he, to crucify Christ, sure. So the Edomites did the exact same thing. They represented a Judas, and um, they had this perpetual enmity against God's people and uh, sided with the enemy to bring the sword against God's people. They will do the same this time. But he said it was the time of the iniquity of the end. I don't think we looked at this last time, so I'd like to look at that because that little phrase right there is also used in um, Ezekiel 21 and 22. Let me read that to you. Um, I'll just show you the phrase and then we'll go back and look at the chapter. Ezekiel 21 and uh, 25 says, O thou... O deadly, wounded, wicked one, the prince of Israel, whose time is come in the time of the iniquity of the end. So wouldn't you think he's talking about the same time? I, I do. And once again, that phrase is used in verse 29, the time of the iniquity of the end. So this Ezekiel 21 and 22 is also the story that we're talking about in, in Ezekiel 34. If you go back to the beginning of Ezekiel 21, you see, um, first of all, all the way through chapter 21, you're going to see that God didn't bring any judgments upon apostate Israel. Now, who is apostate Israel? Apostate Israel would be the harlot at this time, those who have persecuted God's people. In Jesus' time, who was it that persecuted him and the disciples? It was apostate Israel. They were called a harlot in Isaiah chapter 1. Fact, matter of fact, I'm going to read that to you just a little bit. Just a piece of that. Isaiah 1 in verse 21 says, How is the faithful city become a harlot? She that was full of justice Righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. It wasn't it true in Jesus' day? It certainly was. And is it true in our day in spiritual Israel? Yes, it is, because there is an apostate church who will persecute and kill the saints in our day, too. History just keeps repeating. Like I said, first time it's natural, but then it becomes spiritual. So what we're reading here is the story of how God gave all judgment into the hand of the Son of Man. You'll notice that everything that was spoken against or brought to pass, every judgment that was brought to pass against this harlot church came out of the mouth of the Son of Man. 
the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Well, we know it was Jesus. Did Jesus speak the judgments that came upon apostate Israel? He sure did. Did Moses? You know, same type. You know, on and on and on. We see the same types. So Ezekiel, in this case, represents the Son of Man in the man-child, the end-time man-child that we saw he's coming in, the Son of David. Now notice, 21 and 1, it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of Man, a name commonly given to Jesus, right? Son of man, set thy face towards Jerusalem and drop thy word towards the sanctuaries and prophesy against the land of Israel. You know, one of the jobs of the man-child ministry is going to be speaking the judgments that are going to come against the harlot. Why? Because the harlot is persecuting, as throughout history, the saints. And this time we're talking about the harlot of the apostate church, right? History repeats. And, you know, the same story is told so many times so we can figure it out if we're just watching, you know. So he says, um, prophesy against the land of Israel and say unto the land of Israel, thus saith the Lord, behold, I am against thee and I will draw forth my sword out of its sheath and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. You know why? Because it's time that they came out from among them and it hadn't happened. This is the command of the Lord, right? In Revelation 18, come out from among them and be ye separate, right? Says the Lord. Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of its sheath against all flesh all flesh. Now, you know, the sword of the Lord is being raised up against the flesh, even the flesh of God's people. Why? Because it's our enemy. And, uh, you know, if we would have been obedient to the word of God from the beginning, the sword of the word would have put to death that flesh. But God's people avoid things that are painful to their carnal man. And, of course, the sword is painful to the carnal man, and the sword is the Word of God, isn't it? If we would humble ourselves to the Word of God, it would put to death this old carnal life. Praise be to God. It's what we desire in order to come into His image, right? So He, he brings forth out of His sheath the, um, the sword of the Word against all flesh from the south to the north. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, have drawn forth my sword out of its sheath. It shall not return any more. Notice when these judgments start, there is no time for peace and security after that. Especially for the harlot, for the beast, you know, so on and so forth. But at this time, his sword is never going back into the sheath. It's going to be judgment. That sounds like the tribulation, doesn't it? Yeah. It is the time of the iniquity of the end. The sword is never going back, right? Shall not return anymore. And uh, verse 8, you'll notice every judgment came out of the mouth of the Son of Man here. The word of the Lord. You know, I have to say that we have to be on God's side. Some people who are patriotic, uh, they would, of course, think that uh, these people or someone who would speak a judgment against them would be a renegade, you know, would be a, uh, a, cult, a cultist or some an enemy. But you see, we have to be on God's side. The prophets are the ones that spoke the judgments that came upon the apostate people of God. It made them an enemy of these people. They figured these were not patriots. These are the enemy. And quite often they fought against them and killed them sometimes. So here you have it, folks. Here's somebody that's on God's side. You know, we need to be on God's side. And uh, verse, verse 8 says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, and say, Thus saith the Lord, say, A sword, a sword, it is sharpened and is also furbished. It is sharpened that it may make a slaughter. It is furbished that it may be as lightning. Shall we then make mirth? In other words, should we be having a party here? 
uh, the rod of my son, it contemneth every tree. This is the rod of his son. The son of man here represents his son come in another body of the son of David, a corporate body of the son of David in order to bring judgment and to save the people of God, right? Verse 11, And it was given to be furbished that it may be handled. The sword, it is sharpened, yea, it is furbished to give it into the hand of the slayer. What do you think the slayer is? I mean, it's probably the destroyer of um, Exodus chapter 12, right? It's the destroyer in which the Passover was involved, right? Great judgment is coming against those who are not abiding under the blood in the house of the Lord and abiding behind the shelter of the blood, right? Cry and wail, son of man, for it is upon my people, it's upon all the princes of Israel. They are delivered over to the sword with my people. Smite therefore upon thy thigh, for there is a trial or a tribulation, if you will, right? And what if even the rod that contemneth shall be no more, says the Lord? Thou therefore, son of man, prophesy, and smite thy hands together, and let the sword be doubled the third time. The sword of the deadly wounded, it is the sword of the great one that is deadly wounded, which entereth into their chambers. Um, you know, we discovered um, in Jeremiah 25 that Babylon, which is this judgment right here we're reading about, it's ta it speaks of Babylon coming against the people of God. Now, we saw in Jeremiah 25 that when Babylon became the new world order, the first nation that they conquered was Israel. You know, the Bible said in that chapter that judgment begins first with the house of God. Many people don't know how that the great eagle, that was Babylon's symbol, is about to come against Jerusalem. And not only natural Jerusalem, but spiritual Jerusalem. Uh, that is the leadership of the people of God in the New Covenant, right? There is about to be a great persecution, a great turning of this world against the Jews and the Christians, the natural and the spiritual, right? And what does he mean here, doubled the third time? Well, I several things came to me. Number one, Babylon was the third major kingdom that was had conquered Israel. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon. So it's doubled the third time. Okay. Another thing came to me is if you applied this to the just the New Testament church, you would um, you could apply, for instance, the 70 AD destruction of Israel, the Nazi regime's destruction of Israel, and the end time destruction of Israel. Uh, once again, you've got three times that can be applied to the spiritual and the physical people of God. You know, we've had uh, two world wars, and we got another one coming, uh, so on and so forth, right? And in the sword of the deadly wounded, we discovered the deadly wounded down in verse 25 says, O thou, O deadly wounded, wicked one, the prince of Israel, whose day is come in the time of the iniquity of the end. So we're talking about the same thing, speaking about God's people, a judgment against God's people. And and who is bringing this judgment? Well, actually, the man-child is. The, the uh, son of man is. Verse 18. Also, thou son of man, appoint thee two ways that the sword of the king of Babylon may come. See, judge, God has given the judgment over to the white horse rider. And the white horse rider is, comes at the beginning of the seals or the beginning of the tribulation to bring judgment upon the wicked and to also chasten God's people. And uh, especially those who are in the what we call the harlot, the apostate church, right? The backslidden church. So we see here that... Um, once again, the same story we just saw in Ezekiel in a little different form. 
and uh, that the sword of the deadly wounded that the Son of Man is wielding here is Babylon. You know, a lot of people, I think, will be praying and fighting and going and, and whatever they can do to stop the turning of the nations against Christianity. But here God's got his prophet in the midst uh, actually commanding the judgment. So you can imagine that, you know, Jesus wasn't very popular because he was basically bringing judgment against natural Israel. He was correcting them. He was rebuking them. He was renouncing them. And that leadership was out to kill him. And is it any different in our day? No, it's not any different in our day. Some people are looking forward to being in the man-child, but they don't understand exactly what, what this is going to entail, nor what it's going to mean to the people of God. There's a fire coming for the people of God, and um, you know there are going to be a people that will escape this fire like the three Hebrews, but there's going to be a people that are going to be burned up in it too. Um, so let's, let me jump on down and read... Um, Verse 24, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, because you have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions are uncovered. You know, what is it, what is it, is it to have the blood covering? <laughs> there it is again, you know. It is to have faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, first of all, and second of all, to abide in, in your house, which is Jesus Christ, so that the death angel can't touch you, right? These people are uncovered. They have no sacrifice. They're not walking by faith. They've got their own Jesus, you know, um, made up for themselves, you know, to spare the old man, right? So that in all your doings, your sins do appear. In other words, they're not covered. They appear before God. Because that you are come to remembrance, you shall be taken with the hand. And thou, O deadly, wounded, wicked one, the prince of Israel, whose day is come in the time of the iniquity of the end. And thus saith the Lord, Remove the mitre and take off the crown. Uh, this shall be no more the same. Who is he talking about here? He's talking about the leadership of Israel or the leadership of the church as a fulfillment, right? and take off the crown. You can no longer be the leader. Isn't that what Ezekiel 34 says? Yeah, that's right. The Lord says, you're not no longer going to be shepherding my sheep. I'm going to shepherd my own sheep, and I'm going to do it through my servant David. He said, exalt that which is low and abase that which is high. Well, that's exactly what he's doing. Those that claim to be the great leadership over God's people now, but don't they're not covered. They're uh, not walking under the blood. Uh, God's going to humble them and judge them, but he's going to raise up his, his new leadership. In verse 27, 7 says, uh, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. There's those three times again. This also shall be no more until he come whose right it is. Who is he coming that whose right it is to be the new leadership. Obviously, we know it's Jesus himself is coming to shepherd his sheep in his man-child. And I will give it to him. And thou, son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord concerning the children of Ammon and concerning their reproach. And say thou, O a sword, a sword is drawn for the slaughter. It is furbished to cause it to devour, that it may be as lightning. While they see for thee false visions, while they divine lies unto thee, to lay thee upon the necks of the wicked that are deadly wounded, whose day is come in the time of the iniquity of the end. And he says in verse 31, he says, And I will pour out mine indignation upon thee, and I will blow upon thee, with the fire of my wrath, and I will deliver thee into the hand of brutish men, skillful to destroy. Folks, I, you know, many people have 
seen this happen to natural Israel, and it isn't over. I mean, it's going to get a lot worse for natural Israel. They've been very uh, adept and able to defend themselves up until this time, and God has preserved them because of a... Um, a remnant in the midst of them that's actually going to come into the kingdom. But in order to bring that remnant to repentance, and uh, he's going to bring judgment against natural Israel and natural Israel being a representation of the church. He's bringing a judgment against the church because there is a remnant in the midst of the church that God is going to save, not all the church. There's going to be a great falling away. Only God's people can fall away. And so in the midst of the church and in the midst of natural Israel, there is a remnant that God is going to save. And they are going to live under the covering of the blood. See? Uh, but he will deliver thee into the hand of brutish men. We know who those brutish men are, don't we? And I'll read something else to you here. Let's go down to... Uh, chapter 22 and verse 1, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, and, the, o, and thou, son of man, wilt thou judge? Wilt thou judge the bloody city? There it is again. That will be one of the responsibilities of the Lord in the man child is to bring judgment upon the bloody city. Who's the bloody city? The bloody city in Jesus' day was that city who would not turn to God. It was in its sin. It was its leadership of, you know, obviously Jerusalem was the leadership of God's people as a whole. Its leadership was anti-Christ. It was against God. And God judged it too, didn't he, in 70 A.D. And the harlot too will be judged, you know, at the end of the seven years, okay? And verse 23, and it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art a land that is not cleansed, nor reigned upon. So, so in other words, they were still in their iniquities, and there was no latter rain falling upon them. You remember in Jesus' day, the former rain fell upon him, but it, it didn't fall upon Israel, you see. And here is saying, look, it's too late. You're not being cleansed, and you haven't received the latter rain. And it goes on to say that, upon, that, that rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst of her. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls to take treasure and precious things. They have made her Widows, many in the midst of her. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they caused men to discern between the unclean and the clean. Obviously, this is a job of any of God's ministers who are to lead God's people is to know what is sanctified and what is holy and what is unclean. And that's not very well known today because people have departed from the Word as the only rock that we can stand on, right? And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. In other words, they're not ceasing from their own works, are they? And uh, I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey. You know who the wolves are, right? The wolves are the false prophets, the false leaders who are destroying the sheep of God's pasture. To shed blood and to destroy souls that they may get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed for them with untempered mortar. Uh, in other words, they, they are closing up the wall but they're using untempered mortar to close up the wall, something that anything could knock down, right? The wall represents sanctification from the world, right? Separation, protection from the world. You know, as they built the wall of Jerusalem, um, seeing false visions and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not spoken, 
The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery. Yea, they have vexed the poor and needy and have oppressed the sojourner wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should build up the wall and stand in the gap. We recently had a dream about building up a wall and standing in a gap. In other words, so that the enemy couldn't come through, right? Amen. And stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I brought upon their heads, says the Lord. Wow. Awesome judgment there. Look with me in Isaiah 33. You know, what is the, what's going to be the main purpose in all of this? It is to sanctify a body for God's house, His use, His presence, to sanctify a body. And as you saw, there was also a body we call the harlot that had not been cleansed and was not covered by the blood and was under the judgment of God. So God is going to separate a people in these days through these troubles that are coming, even the persecution of the beast and the son of perdition. And I'd like to read it from verse 14 on down. It says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless ones. What are they doing in Zion if they're godless, right? But there are many godless people among God's people, sad to say. And, um, and God is about to ferret them out, just like Judas, you know, was hidden in the body, but was revealed. Who among us can dwell with the devouring fire? We spoke about that before, you know. Obviously, he tells us, who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously, speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppressions and shaketh his hands from taking a bribe and that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from looking upon evil. So, who can walk in the fire? The person that is walking holy before the Lord. The three Hebrews, you know, when the furnace was heated seven times, we saw what times, time, and a half a time was three and a half, seven times is seven years. The, the furnace that was heated seven times hotter burned up the beast, you know, the men that threw the three Hebrews in, but it did nothing to them only burned off their bonds, which is, represents the flesh. The thing that binds us is the flesh, the old man, the sinful life, right? The self-life. So who is it? The person that's determined to walk holy before the Lord, be obedient to his word. These people will make it through the fire. It will do nothing but burn up their enemy, which is this old flesh, right? And uh, But the wicked will say, who among us can dwell with these people? That's good. See, God is making a separation, isn't he? What's, what's going to make the separation? The fire. The fire, the tribulation, the trouble. You see, it's going to make the separation. What will the wicked do? They will turn to the world. They've always been worldly, so they'll turn totally to the world. They will, um, obviously, many of them take the mark of the beast, obviously. A great falling away. The falling away, by the way, happens around the middle of the tribulation, right where the mark of the beast is given. So, Trembling has seized the godless ones. They're fearful. Why are they fearful? Because they have no faith and because they're full of sin, and they know it, and they haven't forsaken their sins. And so their conscience judges them. And, you know... Um, I think it was John G. Lake that spoke about 
when a person's fearful, they absorb the curse. They just absorb it. But when a person's bold in their faith, it just bounces off of them. And that's so true, you know. These, uh, the people who are trembling, uh, the judgment of God is upon them. They don't walk in faith. They're not actually a part of the Passover because they're not walking by faith in the blood. But those that walk righteously and speaketh uprightly and despise the gain of oppressions, shake us their hands from taking a bribe, they're going to be safe. Verse 16, He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. His bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. So there is a provision for God's people who walk holy before him. They will abide in the rocks. And I believe that represents the word of God or the words of God, right? Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. Praise the Lord. You know, many of God's people didn't even recognize Jesus when he came. And they wouldn't see Jesus had he come with, if he came again in another son of David, you know. Um, because the only thing they could recognize is what they can see in the flesh, right? Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold a land that reacheth afar. Thy heart shall muse on the terror. How about that? Not a bit worried about the terror, are they? Where is he that counted? And where is he that weighed the tribute? Sounds like the folks that collect up the offerings for the church, right? <laughs> and where is he that counted the towers? Their places of defense, right? Um... Thou shalt not see the fierce people, a people of deep speech. Thou, shalt, thou canst not comprehend uh, of a strange tongue that thou canst not understand. Thou shalt not see this invading beast army. Notice that. You won't have to worry about them is what, you, what he's saying. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities, Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation. Why do we see in Ezekiel 22, 1 and 22 Jerusalem being destroyed, but here Zion is safe? Because there's a difference between natural Jerusalem that's been given into the hand of the enemy and spiritual Jerusalem that's born again from above, right? You know, the beast destroyed the first Jerusalem, the carnal Jerusalem because it fell into rebellion. Its leadership was in rebellion. But when the people of God came and restored it, it was because they were coming out of Babylon, right? You shall see Jerusalem a quiet habitation, a tent that shall not be removed. The stakes thereof shall never be plucked up, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But there the Lord will be with us in majesty, a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars. And I liken that to be a man-oriented or man-powered um, group, I would say, a sect, a division, uh, shall no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. You know, God with us. Emmanuel, right? He is our savior. And, and truly, you know, when Jesus came, he was Emmanuel, but he was God in a body of the son of David. Now, once again, we're about to see that. God with us. God is going to be with us. And he is coming not only in his first fruits, he's going to come in his whole body, folks. Those disciples were called Christians because they walked and talked and lived like Jesus, right? And after them, the people they raised up did the same thing. Praise be to God. He will save us. Thy tacklings are loosed. They could not strengthen the foot of their mast. 
they could not spread the sail. Speaking about those who are the wicked, right? Then was the prey of a great spoil divided. The lame took the prey. And the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. Praise be to God. What an awesome promise, you know, this is. The Lord's provision that he's made for his holy people is complete. Uh, many of God's people, too, will also uh, be martyred. And um, in order to enter the kingdom, their flesh will be put to death. Um, but for three and a half years, as we've seen, there will be almost complete protection to God's people uh, while they're learning, while God is putting the word in them, while they're coming up to the time of the latter rain being poured up upon them in the midst of the two three and a half year periods, uh, the pouring out of the, the latter rain. This is preparing them to be able to uh, withstand the war of the beast, right? And, of course, uh, some will enter the kingdom through physical death and some will enter the kingdom through spiritual death. But uh, none will perish. You know, in a way, some may perish physically, but their old man will perish. But spiritually, they will not perish. And, as a matter of fact, Jesus said about them that they will never die. And it's true. You know, the... The man that is um, the born-again man, the spiritual man, the inner man, the Christ in you man, he's never going to die. He's never going to perish. Uh, even, even if a person uh, goes through martyrdom, he's never going to perish, right? Praise be to God. Well, we'll, by the grace of God, we'll either take up here next time or start something new. Anyway, we'll leave that up to the Lord. God bless you. For more information and materials, go to www.unleavenedbreadministries.org.